you know, clearly we we know each other um, as we've we've done or interacted probably for about the last couple couple of years. I think since I set up the consultancy, um, I prior to to that, I, I believe you were at Begin and uh, no, you were at Runa Capital. Sorry, get the, get get that right, Chris. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> Yeah, so I mean, I think really for the audience, because it's it's like the floor is yours, Ruslan. Um, there's lots of, um, I, I imagine, interested listeners and watchers. Mm -hmm. um, our, our reach is growing, which Anthony and I are, are proud to admit to, uh, or very proud of. Um, so, you know, look, we, people possibly don't know much about you, so, and, and begin, so the, the floor is yours. Tell us more. Mm -hmm. Sure, sure. Um, thanks, first of all, like, thanks a lot for inviting me, you know, happy to always, happy to catch up, even without, like, filming. So hopefully, when all this kind of crazy pandemias will be down, we'll be catching up again in, like, a different format with beers or something more entertaining. But for now, um, Zoom interview is an interesting option. So, look, as you said, I, I was previously, like, probably, like, a few words about myself. I started my career quite quite in a boring way, probably. I, I went to, like, corporate stuff and uh, I was working with like strategy consultancy firms like McKinsey and IBM um, and it was it, it probably gave me some experience but it was like heck boring and I didn't this was not what I wanted to do and VC career always sort of was kind of interesting for me you know it is it, it, all those guys they, they, they're kind of investing in Google they're investing in Facebook and they're just doing some crap smart stuff that's at least what I saw. And I joined uh, Rooney Capital team. It's like a half a billion fund. And it was an exciting journey. I spent five years there. And um, first of all, I understood that, well, it's not that what you expect, what really people are probably thinking about, like VC job. It's really very little about doing deep researches and analytics and kind of being sort of smart, predicting, hey, this is going to be the next Facebook or this is going to be, I don't know whatever is the next <laughs> crazy stuff, but uh, this job is actually a lot about communication. Actually, it's like much more about like communication, talking to people, and working with people rather than anything else. You you don't need any kind of financial or technical background to analyze like PNL of two year old startup. It's just it's 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 simple. I mean, there's no finger in the wind <laughs> exactly and then i mean like all those kind of financial projections and then the, you know these models i mean they, they never work but and everybody knows it and that, but that's like still kind of everybody still pretends that it's important um so but then it's really a lot about the communication and i think um i clearly understood it and then that's when i met my partner alex who, who is now my partner and He's an amazing guy. I mean, he, he's very, um, he's obviously a very smart person, but he never kind of thinks about him as like too, too seriously, you know, he just don't want to sort of pretend to be like the smartest guy in the, in, in, in the room. Or, and uh, I think what we kind of agreed from the beginning is that we're not going to try to do that with our founders at all. So we're not going to be sort of trying to pretend that, hey, we know everything, etc. And that's what we don't want to do. But what we do want to do is basically we want to be really kind of partners in, in a true meaning of this world that was, I think, somehow kind of lost during this whole sort of all history of the industry. Because like, as you know, like traditionally, all sort of VC leaderships, they call themselves partners, right? And they're, they're all like, like partners, I don't know, partners to each other, but partners to whom? So we just wanted sort of to get back this word. So let's say we, 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 we we're teaming up with founders, we're all partners, we're all in the same boat. We're not the smartest one, probably, hopefully you are, like as a founder, you should be the smartest guy in this company. And uh, otherwise we're screwed up, like we literally really badly screwed up if you are not the smartest guy. <laughs> and so for us, I think what we tried to, to do is uh, to, we didn't want to sort of establish our founder, founder mission or any kind of uh, um, vision or of focus as anything like so super complicated. We didn't want to say that, hey, we're only investing in edutech, health tech, and those projects that have this particular PNL or, or something like this. Because at the end, we decided, hey, it's 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 quite simple. You basically you have your pipeline, right? And then you're investing in the best things you've got. That's like your, your job. So you, you have, let's say you're looking at I don't know, five thousand startups. Uh, 
per year and then you just pick five of them that were the best and they're like and i will never say no to a startup just because it somehow didn't fit my original plan to invest in edutech i mean if the company is great if the founder is awesome it's it's growing and i understand this business i believe in this business why would i say no so for us we we, we decided from the start that we'll be investing without sort of limitations from the starter at least we don't want to the only limit for us is that we will not invest in the things that we don't understand at all so i mean you know if the founder starts to pitch us with something and we just can't understand i mean we're just not smart enough or we are don't have enough background we will probably not go yeah, into that i'd, I'd say Veslin, that's a really good point because um i, I suppose anthony and i and and, uh, uh, and others in in the team here at notwix we we do obviously come across a number of businesses that you know the founders are so i i suppose focused on their business and the world that they're in that they almost become or they almost have an inability to actually uh, demystify and simplify it so that you know people we're generalists probably like like you guys yeah. and you know we certainly like you you probably have to just say to some founders look let's just take it down a level or two yeah. here because this is just flying right over my head. And, De jargon and, it for me, please, right? Exactly. Just like, yeah, explain <laughs> it to me like my five year old. <laughs> exactly, exactly. And I think it's like totally okay, obviously. And probably there, are, there will be some businesses that we'll miss just because we couldn't understand it. Well, that, 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 that's fine for me. I will try. I'll do my best to understand it. But mm. if I can't, it's probably I'm, I'm the wrong partner for you. That's, yeah. that's also a fair statement. And I'm sure that that understanding portion of it goes from just understanding the concept to actually being able to evaluate it as well, right? All is part of that understanding because if it's something very complicated, maybe you can grasp the concept, but mm -hmm. you just have to take the founder at their word then, right? You don't know whether they're right or wrong or, you know, accurate or inaccurate. Um, so yes. I find yeah. that that's a big challenge of it as well. Yeah, I'd also like to add that I, I think there was probably a... I, I used to say a lot of this actually during my days at Bloomberg, but I think there must have been a book written about you have to use lots of really complicated acronyms to, <laughs> to investors because then you'll get more money from them, um, which, you know, especially kind of was a tangent that I think with the right when, when I first came across the rise of cryptocurrency in about 2013, 2014, it was like, it was like let's... I think some people are making things up to make make them sound even more credible to get more money from from investors. Yeah. And it's just crazy. <laughs> this but, guy um, seems to know what he's talking about. Take my money. <laughs> <laughs> I think there's a lot more sense and sensibility in the world now. Uh, certainly, I think a pandemic that probably has 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 brought people slightly back down to earth in terms of founders and and presenting their opportunities i think become a lot more sensible would, would you agree with that Rosalind? Uh, yeah i think i would generally agree with that but probably i think it's again it, it really very much goes down to personalities at the end right so they're like all far as they were very different people right literally yeah. like you met like just i think you you as well right you meet thousands of people i don't know hundreds of people and it's like they're all very different guys and uh there are just some people you, you that are your kind of people, those that you sort of, you feel that you can do business with them, you can be a partner with them. And there are just some that you just, I, mean, I don't know, they're not, not, not your type of people. Well, it's, 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 it's cool. One, at the one end of the spectrum is like people who are a kind of overweight geek speak, I suppose. Mm -hmm. and, and then the other end of the spectrum, it's, you know, I could sell ice to the Eskimos. <laughs> and what you need to be looking for, I imagine, as a, as a VC, is is someone who is kind of right in the middle of that kind of... A uh, translator. You know, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, translator I bet I... Understands it true, truly, yeah. what they're, you know, the tech, what they're trying to do, how, to, how they're positioning the business, the global light, you know, how, how the global reach can be attained because people like the founder, you know? Yeah. 
I think that uh, I think that gut instinct that you're talking about as well, Rosalind, there is quite important where some people, you know, that it clicks and that you can do business and some people, you know, this is not the right, you know, founder for me because, mm -hmm. you know, some of these founder relationships last longer than a lot of marriages. So, you know, you got to have a good gut instinct as well for the person you're getting, getting into business yeah. with. And so, I mean, I, I, can, I can tell you, it's, it's really, it, it, it's, it's indeed sort of this kind of click moment sometimes. I mean, like for, for us, I mean, we're, we're closing the deal right now. We'll just kind of probably share this quick story with you. Uh, the deal will be closed, hopefully, like this week and next week, but without like too much detail. So basically we had a call with the founder and it was like Friday. Um, and I mean, he, the, the, the guy was like amazing. He was like, he had a immense experience in the, what he was doing, but then he was explaining everything you know, those people who have actually a lot of experience, they actually explain everything really, really easily that you don't really feel yourself as a fool. They kind of, they tell you the things that they're planning to do and you kind of 100% feel safe that they will definitely will accomplish that. So we had this call on Friday and then on Sunday, we sent him an email. Hey, we are, we, we are willing to invest. Just that, that's like a hard commit from us. Uh, on Tuesday, we had like a second call with him and we were already kind of wearing... Uh, the t-shirts of this company uh, on this call <laughs> so, and we were kind of ready okay look we, we haven't seen like your full financials or kind of that much details but we kind of we believe in you as a person like uh, we, we want to be partnered with you and then and like what happened at the end that right now it's a as you know we're we're relatively small fund so we have like around 30 million under management so and the round was like 8 million euro round so like a huge round for us, but believe me or not, like right now we're leading this round with 2 million euros. We're leading 8 million round deal <laughs> just because, you know, basically we had this sort of good feeling with the founder. He loved us. He, he liked our approach he, and he just told everybody else. There were like a lot of other investors who wanted to join. He said, hey, hey those guys are leading and you can no join problem. or not. And then the rest, they just joined. And then that, that's how it happened. So sometimes when you have this kind of click, you can, act yeah. quite fast and that's like how we want yeah. to and, uh, however i probably caveat that with possibly how many people do you look at in a say given month or, or year you know do you look at you know i think we you know we've had several people who've said it, it's in the thousands or over ten thousand. just how many decks do you get sent and and you know or is yep. it no, yeah, I think it's probably like per year, I guess we receive something around five, seven, maybe thousand. I guess that's what we kind of receive per year. Well, right now, and it's getting more and more like, you know, yeah. as a new fund, obviously, you start, your, your name doesn't appear any, anywhere. So you like, for the, probably the first month was not that active, but let's say right now it's getting to this five, six, seven thousand that I used to get also before I was part of the ruling capital team. So you're kind of getting back to the same levels. And that's like the normal level. The, the reality is that, you know, probably like obviously 90%, you just say no right away, just because you don't. It's the other side of that gut instinct. You just go, yeah, no, this is not for us. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. But you all may see it in the initial email, the outreach or, or the, the deck itself. You just know, no, no not for us. Yeah. yeah, I think, you know, basically it's kind of a quite a weird business overall, right? So this VC type of business, like everybody's receiving those thousand decks, right? So it's like, I'm, I'm definitely not unique here. Like everybody's just doing those thousands and deck and eventually everybody's making just a couple of several investments per year. I know like five, 10 investments per year. So it's always kind of a game of super small numbers. You know, clearly you, you possibly not mention this but uh, i will mention it now you are based in moscow uh, which again pandemic we're in i'm in south london anthony's in central london possibly wouldn't have ever uh, uh, dreamt of doing this if, if, if covid hadn't, hadn't have kind of really come along i mean it's it's provided the opportunity <laughs> yeah i mean perfect for to grow our you know we've, we've, we've grown a vast amount of international followers for, for not wix during the pandemic but that's about promoting not wix i mean the point i was making was you know your deal flow you're in moscow you, you get this six seven thousand pitch decks a year 
that's through your network of other VCs that you know globally or, or you know different people you know just if you can explain how if I was a founder how how could I how could I shine my deck in your direction no I mean like I think you, you kind of raised several questions all, all, all in one so the last one is actually the most e easy one so we, if you want to send an email to my direction there's like my emails everywhere i mean you can find it in crunchbase you can find my email in um on our website or or in, in many other sources so like it's like part of my strategy is put my email everywhere okay. the of this podcast on the on the script at the bottom of the podcast we'll, we'll add it if, if you want us to absolutely yeah definitely so that's basically kind of also part of the strategy just put your email wherever it could fit you know, that someone will ever find it. <laughs> so that's like just, just just part of it. And then about the sort of the pipeline cr creation overall, like being in Moscow. I mean, overall, like most of the time before this whole pandemic started, I was spending my time uh, in uh, London. And then so, so sort of my part, the same was for my partner. And then now we had to sort of, and we understood that everybody was on the lockdown and my family said, so my parents live here. So I decided to sort of go back to Moscow. And so... And now it's kind of a, quite a weird time. Like I think, yes, I am physically located in Moscow right now, but like everybody is located in their apartment. Actually, it's 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 like no different where this apartment is located. Um, and for some reason, I mean, I think I can take the best of both worlds in a sense. So I kind of I still have some good life conditions in Moscow. I have overly some. Uh, pipeline that goes from here because everything is quite open here so I can take you know everything uh, from my life in Moscow but then majority of my pipelines those like I know three four four thousand they're definitely coming from Europe partly from United States and where are they coming from yes it's usually it's, one is probably network uh, that's the all, all network I have from my previous career and that we are trying to build more and more now um, it's definitely our founders so people who i work with and people who i don't work with so i mean i have from time to time i have received like emails from people to whom i said no unfortunately but they just still kind of keep me connected with other founders and so i think again there's quite a simple rule of thumb right so um obviously there will be always those thousand startups that you'll be receiving and it's like no matter what you do, if you're just your name is in Crunchbase, you will be receiving those thousand startups. They are not probably the best quality of startups, but you will be receiving those emails anyway, those like mass emails. But that actually doesn't matter much. It's not what you're looking for. It's not what we call it all pipeline, but that's not a pipeline in, in, in reality because those like emails just go to directly to junk right away. But then so what you do care about is right, so those out of this. 6,000 or whatever thousand startups, you, you only care about those, let's say, 20, 50 that will be sort of great startups that, that will reach, hit your inbox. You won't be able to make deal with all of them for various reasons. Obviously, some of them don't fit your stage, your whatever reason, but then that's the real pipeline that you care about, right? And then so if you talk about well, that, was, that was 20 to 50, did you say? I think probably per year, it's really about that. 20 to 50 really startups that where you really pay your deep attention to where you actually do quite a deep diligence, you, you, you evaluate them. I think it's around... And, and, and rather than, would, I, would I say that you, um, I think uh, Alex, um, Savili, yeah. have to all be in agreement on on that particular business to do that due diligence or do you do you all have you know 20 to 50 a year and then you, they do individual work on them and then they present them to you i'm just curious how how do you make that that mm -hmm. decision no so i mean look uh, we're we're small funds so they're just two partners me and alex basically okay. more, more 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 or less and we most more or less sitting in front of each other we have a very small office so we have actually one table there's just one table for two of us so we're sitting i in... hope you're socially distanced <laughs> not really where that's where it comes they're a bubble culture they're a bubble in, you know? it's okay <laughs> <laughs> so yeah so we're, we're literally watching each other day after day and so it all comes very naturally you know when you, you when you see something interesting 
you you already share it I mean, over the lunch, over just sort of maybe the same moment you kind of feel that something interesting, you, you just share it right away and you kind of discuss it right away uh, always. And then as a small team for us, what we need to come to conclusions like both of us like the products, obviously we will not likely invest if only one kind of feel passionate about if, if if only one of us feel passionate about the product we will probably come to agreement to invest like a small amount small check but usually we just go with the startups but that both of us like mm -hmm. and then we have also an advisory board and it's, it's kind of very uh funny stuff we, we we ask our advisory board just to say one thing to us just say say, say no to us i mean for whatever reason so that's your job for our advisory board just to say no to us just come up with like many reasons why, why we should not do this stuff because we have a lot of enthusiasm on our own side. So we know why we want to invest. It's like, we're a very enthusiastic person. We love to, I mean, if we have a lot of money, we'll probably give all of them all around. But so uh, we need someone just to stop us from doing that crazy stuff. And so the process, usually, as I said, we have like those 20, 50 quality startups. We discuss it between both of us and if sort of we still like them after week or two weeks because you know there's usually this excitement period like right after you had a call for the next couple of days you feel really excited about this stuff before you kind of just give it a little bit more thinking usually this excitement goes a little bit down that's normal uh and then you know if, if, if for the next like couple of weeks we still feel excited about the products we just go to our advisory board and if they also don't have enough reasons to say us no we, we, that's how we go through the deal so it's usually very fast for us we're uh, probably the, the fastest deals we were closing was like a couple of weeks from right. and, yeah. and would you say the well number one the covid the use of zoom the accessibility to people has in, improved do you, do you think that two weeks has possibly been helped by the the, the way we we now all work and the way you invest um uh -huh. that, I, I don't. I mean, I actually I think for, for probably without Zoom, it will, will probably be even faster. And what, what kind of Zoom? Uh, this COVID kind of doesn't allow me to travel directly to, to, to the founder. Like, you, if I like before all this kind of crazy stuff happened, when we yeah. like the founder, we just were buying a tickets and flying over to him to just to have a coffee with him or, or beer with him, just to have this sort of. Do you think you'll go back to that, Ruslan? Is yeah. I mean, we, we, we would love to do that. I mean, I think, you know, it's very important to hear. Of, I mean, I, I'm okay with those Zoom calls, but I think that those personal relationships, it's, it's really hard. It's, it's much harder to build them over Zoom. So when you just can, you know, I don't know have a beer together, it's it's totally different level of attitude. And as you said, it's kind of marriage, right? It's very, can you imagine getting married without actually seeing a person? I mean... <laughs> I, I, I'm taking all the sort of intimate part away, but it's still kind of weird, right? It's, you, 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 you really want to just sort of see this person, how he reacts to certain stuff. You want to see how I, he... I think I read somewhere about... I, can't, I think it was some possibly in Japan where people were marrying avatars that they, they met online. Yeah. <laughs> strange. <laughs> but I mean, you, you know... It, if it's an avatar, that is probably still okay. But maybe, <laughs> maybe, the, well, maybe the prenup is an NFT. You never know. <laughs> you never know. Yeah, yeah it's a know. smart contract. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Oh, funny. So, sorry, I, we digress. But I, I'm also interested on, on that point with your advisors. Uh, in, interesting advice to other funds. Um, I think it's always very, very important how carefully... Um, funds choose their advisors because I, I'd imagine the people you have on on the board I haven't actually looked sorry excuse my lack of research but I'd imagine are they international are they from a an investment background are they from a technology background I'm just curious have you got a mix of advisors just if you could talk a bit about that yeah it, it's definitely mixed they have various backgrounds they're actually two types of advisors we have in our board one type of advisors it's let's say people who are from like a business environment like with particular expertise let's say we have a marketing advisor or sales advisor so this is a person we very experienced uh and obviously he can help us to evaluate the opportunities but then most importantly he helps us to work with portfolio companies he can you know 
if if needed, he can just go to and help the, the companies to you know crack some questions and give some some advice with his expertise. So we just try to involve those people to work with our portfolio companies. That's like one type of advice we have. And then the other type of advice advisors, those are yeah, they're typically sort of the investors themselves. So they're either kind of angels or they're coming from later stage funds. So they have some ex- investments in, in experience in investments. So yeah, for them, it's mostly we just kind of admire their experience and uh, can rely on something. advisors do you have, Rosalind? Just out Sorry? of interest. How many do you have? It's, 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 it's around six advisors right now. Okay, good, good, good. Um, Thanks for that. Um, I'm curious to find out a bit more about how, how you have found the the fundraising environment, because obviously Begin is a, a relatively new fund. Um, you, you spent I, I, probably the usual timeline for most of the funds we talk to. It's 12 to 18 months or maybe two years to, to set up, you know, the actual initial investment. Just curious is the how's the you know is it a number of lps is it is it um, low russian uh, money mm-hmm. is it you know international i'm just curious how how, how you found the fundraising and, mm-hmm. and and what what's who are you managing the money for right so look i mean i think it's, it's kind of hard to sort of Put a particular limit like did it take us 12 months or you can say that it t- took you like entire life because obviously the, the real the process of sort of putting everything together was not that long it was actually less than a year but then that be- just because the sort of you you had this experience from your pre- previous life so like my partner he was an angel investor himself for like many years so he had all those sort of connections people who invested with him before and then sort of I, from my career of like in the VC, I also had some people who were investing together with us, who was working with me before. So literally the process was just sort of, we all only needed to really to find some kind of a major LP to, to, to seal the, the, the main amount. And then the rest was relatively fast. And um, obviously right now our mix, is, it's both mix of Russian and European money. So it's kind of a mix. We don't have a lot of, LPs, so and the fund is intentionally small. We didn't want to, so there were basically two things we can do, right? So we can spend probably more time and raise a larger fund. Um, what we decided to do is that we will do the fast fundraising. We'll raise not that much money, so like we raised thirty million uh, US dollars, and we decided that we can just probably just not spend those mo- time to to raise money, but rather spend those money to invest and prove that we are a good investor. So, and, and then go back to, 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 to with like more results. Obviously when you're a first time fund, there is not that much that you can show, but then after we invest this 30 million, hopefully we <laughs> will have something to show and that will be different the story. So we decided to not raise too much, but rather take a small amount or invest it and then raise with some results. And, and, and so far the amount of investment you've made, Ruslan, in, in the fund? Yeah. I think we're we're getting close to the half of, of our investments that, that we're making. It's, it's still less than half, I guess, but we will be closing a lot of deals actually in just in the next three months. As we have like quite a lot of deals that are in a sort of closing stage right now. And then I think before I think you hit the beach, yeah, yeah. <laughs> at, uh, at, at what <laughs> at what point of uh, deployment of your fund? Uh, would you go out to start raising the second fund, do you think? Do you wait until you're 70%, 90%? Are you already doing it now? I, th- I think it's very much dr- dr- driven by sort of what will happen with our portfolio, right? So you obviously want to go to, 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 to another round of fundraising when you have something exciting to show, you know, something exciting to show. So hopefully if maybe, I don't know, not, not necessarily like a huge unicorn success, but then when you have something great happen with your portfolio, when you clearly see that you hit something great, you just have some sort of facts to show to your new investors. That's when we want to do it. And hopefully it's going to be, let's say somewhere next year uh, when we'll be, let's say, I don't know, 70% or... And, and, and is there a, a trend line emerging in your investments in terms of the verticals that you're investing in? Um, good question. <laughs> 
I, to be honest, I, I don't think so. I mean, we, we definitely probably have, if you look at our portfolio today, there will be a lot of products that are somehow connected with like consumer behaviors. So it, it's either B2C projects or B2B2C. So it, it, it's, it's, it, it's somehow connected to that, but not necessary. And we, we, yeah. we don't really want it this way. We, 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 what we, I think where the trend is coming actually, and the trend is, the type of founders we love to invest in. So those kind of personalities, I think we have, we're coming to certain type of a person who is like our ideal founder. Uh, and in this sense, yes, we're coming to some particular focus, but it, it doesn't really depend on the industry. I don't see really much difference if you are, you know, if you're selling um, furniture or you are selling uh, whatever, like software, it's it's not that much difference in the business, right? The, all, all of them could work. It's not that, that all unicorns will be in uh, fintech and there will be no unicorns in health tech. I mean, there will be unicorns everywhere. So everybody can do business. We just find the founder who is experienced, he knows his stuff. And so he will go to, to the unicorn. So you talk about unicorns. Mm. Uh, I mean, realistically, well, I hope that there are going to be unicorns in, in the portfolio, uh, as I do <laughs> my friends. Mm who are VCs, um, but it's sort of practically speaking, what, what sort of type of exit are you looking for with your portfolio as you, you look, at, look ahead? Um, I mean, obviously, you know, the more is better. So <laughs> we don't sort of, we, we obviously want to, whenever we invest, we want to make sure that there is a, some sort of potential for 10x returns, uh, et cetera. I would say it's generally, quite hard to predict it, especially as an early stage, you know, will it gonna be, I don't know, 200 million company or 2 billion companies. Actually the difference is it, it's coming to really lots of things, partially about luck, partially about like the market condition, partially about like tons of stuff. So you can't really predict at the early stage. So what we wanna make sure that there's definitely a potential, that's one. And second, that there's a person who's in charge is capable of sort of being a CEO of this type of a large corporation. And if this two is in place, there will be like different scenarios that you can't predict. I mean, I can tell you one scenario from our portfolio that happened already. We had, we have one exit, by the way. Uh, and yeah, and it was quite an interesting story. Um, and this is actually, this is a Russian story because it, it was one of the companies we have from Russia. We have right now about, um, 11 portfolio companies and there are two from Russia from out of those and one of them got an exit um, and it was super fast investment and exit um, and the founders they are we call them pirates I can tell you later what we mean by them but they're like true pirates um, extremely strong pe people I mean there are two of them and uh, they were building a business of dark stores grocery dark stores which is obviously getting super popular right now in Europe, I think you heard, we heard of Jiffy and um, Gorillas in Germany, there are like many of them, but that's mm. all happening just now. But then they started this business in 2018. And there was like far be before all of them and their background was in real um, grocery business, like an offline traditional one. And so they started with just two stores. That's when we invested. Um, they had two grocery stores and then in one and a half year, uh, they had 200 of those. So they grow wow. like 200 stores and there was like monthly per was like close to 15 million per month uh, in one and a half year from two stores. And they were growing like crazy and they got this acquisition offer. Uh, and then obviously since we're also talking about some spe specific stuff in Russia, in Russia is when you get an acquisition offer, you just take it. Just because there's just not that many uh, potential acquirers, there's just not that much capital, international capital. So when you get this M&A offer, you take it and they get acquired. And the acquisition price, it was good acquisition price. Uh, I can't name it, but it's like really, really good acquisition price. But look, the company was just one and a half year operate, like less than two years operate. There was like a huge potential in front of them. And like right now, this business is, it's, it's a unicorn business right now, but they were acquired like much earlier. It's, it's, it, yeah, right now it's like clearly unicorn business. They have like close to 600 dark stores there, like, Toronto right now it's just enormous really? it's, yeah, it's amazing um, yeah and, and I so suppose you, you might do you regret the exit came so early 
and there was, I mean, you can't, it's hard to regret it because there's there no option. I mean, you know, you, you, that was the reality. So, and that's what I'm saying is that, you know, sometimes it's just hard to predict when you're going to be investing in, a, in another company, everything will go good and you'll get an M&A offer at, let's say, I don't know, a couple of hundred million valuation. Will you say no? I mean, it depends on so many things around. So we are not really planning that, hey, we want only invest in unicorns. We want to invest in great companies that have the potential. Yeah. But then that's it. Okay, fascinating stuff. I, you, you touched on the Russian environment. Um, I, you know, going back a number of years, I, I worked with uh, Yandex and Mail.ru, and it, it, I think it was in the, you know, the, the, the 2006, 7, 8, the, I suppose the, the real boom, boom period possibly for Russian tech. Um, I'm, I'm kind of, you know, because I think they all went on to do massive IPOs on, well, they did massive IPOs on NASDAQ. And then I always remember there was a big kind of, when, when I was at, you know, sort of Bloomberg in from 2012 to 17, there was, there was a kind of area outside of Moscow that was heralded as the real innovation centre for, 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 for Russia. And I, I don't hear so much about the Russian scene um, or haven't, in the last few years, I'm, I'm curious, you know, if you look at, you know, uh, you know, are, are there a number of local treasures that we're just not hearing about because they're being consumed by Russian, local Russian VCs or just, I'm just keen to understand. And I think the audience would like to hear like where, where, where's the Russian tech scene at the moment. And, you know, clearly mm -hmm. you're, you're one of the key, key players in the ecosystem. Sure. So look, I mean, Russia is a huge country. It's like 140 million population and, and, and more than that, right? So obviously um, there are certain things that come and go like politics and et cetera, then you can do nothing about it. They, you know, especially I think here in, in Russia, you kind of know that probably better than others we have changed like during the last hundred of years, we've changed I know, several countries. So uh, we know how those things uh, can, can change a lot. So, but then still it's kind of 145 million population that, that are, well educated, um, especially in technical point of view, and um, overly, some of them are quite talented. It's just game of at least game of numbers. You know, if you have the right education, plus if you have hundred forty millions, uh, there will be more and more companies coming from around. I think what changed really is this sort of marketing stuff and politics stuff, and that basically will mean that the new unicorns that are appearing right now, actually in Russians, they do appear. They either follow this way of, let's say, Revolut, right? Because it's kind of a Russian company originally. Like the founder, like Nick, he's, he's Russian. I mean, but like, who, who, can, who can now tell that he's, it's, it's a Russian company? Because they have to move out of Russia right away. And so they build their business outside of Russia. That's one scenario. And then the second scenario is those, like the company that I mentioned right now, which is a unicorn company again right now. It's, it, I mean, they can go public. They probably go, will go public, but they get acquired early because international investors will not go into invest in Russia due to those risks, but it's like, it's an amazing company. It's really, they, they went through, as I said, from zero to 15 million monthly revenue in just a little bit over a year. It's, it's a unique result. It's, you, you, it's hard to find those anywhere in the world. Nice. So all the things are there, they still exist, but they are just less marketing about it. And either people are trying to go outside of Russia right away and build those businesses like Revolut or they build there and build here and uh, get acquired here. So stay there. Yeah. Okay. And then on the investment side, um, you know, obviously we've talked about Runa and Begin. Um, are, are there many other VCs? Are there, is there a growth in VC as an asset class amongst, uh, amongst I, I suppose, Russian uh, families you know, are investing more in tech on um, via these VCs. I'm just curious if you could expand. Sure. Uh, yeah, I think uh, probably. Yeah, I, I, we do see more and more VCs appearing. I can't say that there's like a huge sort of boom of it coming. In. I think this is sort of the, the main uh, growth time was around ten years ago when there were like really lots of them appearing. Now there's still sort of new names appear on the market, but not that actively. Um, I think 
the, the most the specific stuff here is uh, like talking about begin capital and maybe some other VC funds is that the whole game of VC, it's quite an international game, right? So I mean, you, you have those VC from one country investing to other startups. You have like American VCs or whatever Chinese VCs coming in. And that's like the game of the big money at the end, what you expect, right? So you want to, that, that salt bank to come at the end and put this billion dollar on top of something like this, one of those things happening. And when the ecosystem became, became close, like Russia ecosystem right now, it's a little bit close in terms of VC money. Um, it's starting to be hard to play this VC game. And so what many VC funds like Begin Capital as well, what we are doing right now, as you can see, uh, we're investing a lot outside of Russia, like majority of our portfolio right now. We have like four companies in London, actually. We have two companies in New York and now we're closing two deals in Netherlands. So we're going global and um, that's how we feel about ourselves. Also sort of being a global oriented, global minded partners. Mm -hmm. And then what, what do we try? And, and many other VC funds in, in originally from Russia, they, they kind of pull the same approach. And and do you envisage that as, I suppose, the the year or the next few years, we perhaps normalize or we get used to living with the pandemic and we travel, that your international reach may become localized? So you may have, pe you know, people in I, I, San Fran or, or in New York or, or London, how do you think that the, the, the business may grow in its global reach? Yeah, so I mean, we, we, we set up our legal entity in, in, in London. I mean, we were in London literally before and we will be back to London. I mean, after all, all this sort of things will happen. So we want to be sort of headquartered from, from London originally. And obviously as team will grow, we don't know where, where will be sort of our best portfolio companies, where, where they will be located, we'll be probably opening some other local presence and hopefully if we will become a larger fund. We have money to open new offices, we will be opening new offices. So definitely we want to be an international player. We don't want to be sort of focused on a particular country. Okay. From and, and that localization is driven by the fact that you're, you're quite hands-on with the, the founders you invest in. You, you you kind of like to be near them or in proximity to, to them. I mean, I'm, mm -hmm. what's your what's your interaction with, with founders or are you just a fund that gives, gives the money and sets the hurdle rate and says, beat it? <laughs> <laughs> Good luck. <laughs> <laughs> no, yeah, no, look, we... we I think we never wanted to sort of use this pray and phrase strategy when you sort of just pour your small checks everywhere and and asking for some second secondaries or whatever kind of small stuff and uh, wait for return silently. We want here. You think for us, it's it's actually the question of the pipeline. I mean, we are talking about portfolio, but that's a question for of the pipeline for us because what we want to be right. So we want to to have this the, the case when majority of our real pipeline, as I said, those like top 20 great companies that are coming from our portfolio companies that those are recommended to us. So we want other people just to tell about, hey, those guys are great, you, you should work with them. And maybe you will tell somebody, hey, those guys are fun. I mean, they, they're good and they, they're, they're doing a great job. Just talk to them. And, and that's how we want to work with our portfolio companies. And for this type of relationship, it, yes, it is important to be close it is important to sort of be helpful. It is important to be involved. Uh, and that's basically what, what we wanted to do. And yes, we are missing this, those travel times when we can you know, build an even stronger relationship with founders. It feels still sort of okay right now. We kind of managed to maintain those relationships with founders right now. But um, as I said, it's a different story when you can have a beer together. Do you do in normalized times? Do you do the whole uh, glamour scene that I used to call it, where you you, you go and speak at slush and uh, tech 
summit or whatever it's you know ai summit you know or or any of the other sort of fandango conferences are you, are you into that ruslan or do you not have the time or the capacity look i i, I used to do it a couple of times i can't say that you're getting a lot out of it probably maybe i'm not the best speaker or or, or anything i think for us what we're trying to do i feel that overall media or internet right now have a broader reach actually so if let's say you are active in internet if you kind of post on linkedin or twitter etc it will have a broader reach and so that's the way how you can show your expertise it's much broader than if you sort of tell some couple of smart words from the stage when no one's really watching that much so that's one and then the second as i said if you want to have a quality leads they are not going to be out of those panel talks they will be likely from building a relationship so for me it's mostly either you're building a relationship like long-term relationship or web media that's like the yeah. way the way to get it broke just sort yeah. of I, I think i agree with you there because i think we we all probably on this call spent 10 years 12 years or, or, or maybe a bit less but doing the, the the conference schleck um and and you know lo and behold it's built great foundations for each of our networks um mm -hmm. but i think moving forward the one thing we i think certainly the pandemic has equalized is is people's time and the effectiveness of of you know i'll possibly maybe go to one conference a year mm -hmm. maybe yeah. as things get normal whereas it used to be you know in certain months uh, in previous years like two or three a month which was just crazy but you know the bar is a lot higher i think right to, to yeah. get people to to get up and go out and you know sit yeah. around talking or watching in real life versus you know being able to dip in and out right especially yeah, think, look at clubhouse think, right <laughs> <laughs> well I, I think things like what we're doing with with the podcast or the podcast people the feedback we're having is is exactly you know this is a great way of finding out more that for, for say a founder about begin capital that you know that founder would have had to have you know paid a play you know paid a ticket pay, paid for the flight gone to finland in the freezing cold in november and maybe <laughs> had seen you on stage and tried to grab you and talk to you and had got got nowhere because you would have been ushered backstage straight away and 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 then they try and stalk you on the social media and they get nowhere and you know you know it's kind of this inclusivity that i think things like this help accessibility is, as well yeah oh, yeah yeah so yeah. Good, good so and then look and we're coming cl close to the end and i know you're a very busy man and i think what's what's the time there at the moment is it about four, four o'clock you you mean you mean Moscow? No, it's just two o'clock. Yeah. Moscow. Two o'clock. Okay, sorry, I thought you different, different uh, more more ahead. Um, I always like to ask this: your top tip for a VC and your top tip for a founder. What would they be? Okay. Um, uh, good question. I think the top tip for founder. I will start with this one. Um, is really. Um, the most important job of a founder is really to recruit people. And that's it, basically. It's actually the only job of the founder. And for a founder, it's really important to be able to hire people, to be able to hire great people, the smart people, the people who can lead the company. Because eventually, you know, as a person, you can't achieve that much. It's all, 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 always a sort of team and uh, that is achieving and building the business at the end. And what defines the success is that if you have a team of professionals that are sort of can crack the case, or if you have a team of sort of, I don't know, people who are okay and average and mediocre, and, and this is a game of winning or losing, right? So if you're basically what you're trying to do as a startup, right, the whole this sort of VC story and the startup story is about creating a crazy stuff. You, you basically want to build a company that will out of nowhere become a huge business, right? So it's impossible to do with like average people. It's impossible to do if you are doing just the job normal way. So for me, it's very important also when I evaluate 
the company is to look at the what, what are the first hires, how good are they? Can you attract those people? And so that's the advice. Just be, don't be afraid to waste time on hiring. Don't hire those, you know, kind of recruiting guys that will help you to hire. That's your job. That's the most important job you can do. Um, then my only advice to VC, I mean, just don't be too serious about everything, I guess. <laughs> I mean, it's, it's, it's a relationship business, as I said in the beginning, right? So uh, make sure you are sort of all understand that we're, we're, we're obviously doing the serious stuff. It's, it's a business, it's, it's jobs, people have jobs we're paying. It's not kind of a, uh, you know, that we're sort of entertaining anybody. It's, it's a serious stuff. I don't want to sort of mimic it in, in, in the wrong way. Uh, it's a serious business. But then be human I mean, to, to, to the founders you're talking to. We just make, so sort of kind of try not to be those kind of smart ass guy who just say, yeah, that's my rules. Uh, that's how you should do. There's no other way. It's, it's all about sort of building a relationship in the end. And that's our very long-term business. Actually, VC fund is very long-term business. You, you, you can build a great startup in three years and sell it. You can't build a great VC in three years. It's just impossible. It's always a story. So like for me and Alex, when we started, we said right away, okay, that's the story for us for the next 20 years. Yes, agree. Uh, and so if you're talking about 20 years, then you can, it's not the same as building a startup. So you have to build a very human driven, partnership driven, relationship driven. So that's probably the advice. Great. Um, so, you, you, I mean, one thing I've got from this podcast, as known as your, your real passion, which is fantastic. And, you know, I imagine it's quite a time consuming role you have. But just as, a, as an aside, if you or and when you do relax, what what's what's kind of the, the, what's on the menu? Is it is it movies on Netflix? Any tips? Is it books? Just what what's your what's your downtime consist of? Sure. I mean, yeah, to, to be honest, I'm not the sort of type of a person. I'm not going to tell that I have like lots of hobbies. I'm not into sports. For some reason, my body allows me not to do any sports and I still feel <laughs> fine. <laughs> Maybe yeah. it will change soon, but like I'm not into that much in, into sort of sports. I'm not that much into movies. I love my job. That's actually my love, my passion. I used to love travel a lot. That was my second passion, actually. I love to travel in Africa, in India, China, mm -hmm. Travel the world, and I was, I used to do it a lot. It was my big passion. Right now, during the last two years, I obviously do it much less because there's all this kind of restrictions, etc. Uh, but I love to. With, do that. with travel, I always like to ask this question: Would you want to travel to Mars or the Moon? <laughs> I mean, to be honest. Not really. I think there are just my, my, my third option: travel to space. Just dip into space and then maybe come back. <laughs> I feel that there are just so much exciting stuff going on much closer to us. That well, why would I go that far? I, I don't think that this obviously it's a, it's a unique experience, but yeah. there are just so much things like I want to visit on Earth. I mean, yeah. there are so many countries that I haven't visited yet. There are so many things. Pro Earth. Pro Earth. I like that. Pro Earth. I can't wait for the space hotel to open up and get one of those rooms with a view of watching the Earth orbit. I think, you know, yeah. knock on wood, fingers crossed. I think that would be probably the coolest thing. I, I won't be on the first flight. <laughs> no, not the first one. <laughs> We're offering a big discount for first-time flyers. <laughs> no. Sign no, this waiver. It. <laughs> yeah. Well, it, it's uh, it's been great to catch up, Ruslan, and you know I hope we obviously continue our interactions in the next 20 years as, as you you i imagine build a great business and you know it, it well done on what you've done so far and you know keep keep uh, keep flying the the flag because you, you're helping a lot of founders across the globe really succeed so thank you from me and anthony yeah thank, thank you very much well, guys. It was good a luck. pleasure talking to you we'll be happy to you know continue those conversations Thanks, Scott. Cool. Thanks. Thanks. Take care. See Bye. you in London. Bye. Bye. Bye.